today's video is going to be a features overview of the Tascam 244, which is a model that I've covered an awful lot in terms of repair. Got something like 30 videos about repairing different aspects of this. But I've never actually done a, a review or features overview, so here we go. This model was released in 1982. I'm looking at a review online, British Review, and uh, it's got the pricing recommended retail price of £655.68, which is just seems a bit random, like why not make it 650 or 675 But anyway, that's how much they were asking for in 1982. According to my Bank of England inflation calculator, that is in the region of £2,260 in 2020 money, which is around $3,100. So not a cheap item. It's funny, I'm in a Facebook group and, you know, you get people like complaining about these things costing more than 100 quid. Um, because for a while I was picking these up, fair enough, in need of a bit of uh, TLC, but really you're only just needing cleaning and rubber change for about 40 or 50 pounds uh, relatively recently, like 2015 or something, you could get, easily get these for under 100 pounds broken down. They're sitting at the time of making this, maybe about 400 quid is what you would pay for a serviced one, or maybe 100, 150 for a broken down one. But that represents a tiny fraction of what they cost when they were new. I suppose it's just you know, Moore's Law, computing power, introduction of new technology has meant that you can get a lot of the same facilities out of digital tech, and which costs much less. Anyway, I digress. This is the second unit that Tascam slash TIAC brought out. The 144 was its predecessor. And uh, the appearance in the layout is very similar. I'm talking about that and the price because I'm trying to give you a sense of where this was pitched in the market. Um, at the point that this came out, there weren't really low-budget, highly portable Porter Studios multi-track recorders available um, Fost XX15 hadn't come out yet, Porta 1 hadn't come out yet, so it was either get a TX144 or this, its replacement. As such, it was kind of pitched. I suppose you'd say it's the high end of the market, but the, it didn't really have that much competition when it first came out. And so, compared to like you know, a 2 inch tape machine, it's very portable because you can actually lift it. Um, but it's not that portable, it's 9 kilograms. Um, it's got a metal chassis under there, so in a way, it's like really robust, but actually. I should know because I've posted dozens and dozens of these um, all over Europe and uh, on a couple of occasions the, the cases got broke. Mostly in the way to me rather than for me to a client I might add but yeah they're pretty heavy. Um, one person can carry it okay but you wouldn't really want to take it on public transport you know you'd want to have a car if you're moving it anywhere. If we're talking about close equivalents, then I suppose the TIAC 144 is similar in a lot of ways. Uh, the TIAC 144 had shelving, high and low IQ, IQs, beg your pardon, EQs, whereas this has got two band parametric. I'll go into that in a bit more detail. I prefer these. There was Dolby B, I think it was B, and the 144, whereas this has got uh, DBX. I prefer the sound of DBX, I mean but it does mean you're gonna get some weird sounding sort of compression artifacts if you try and play back then we should be in your 144 on this 244, vice versa. The transport in here is of a much better design from the point of view of somebody trying to repair this. Um, I've made a bunch of teardown videos of the 144 and it's quite difficult to take apart compared to this. This unit, there's a section down the middle where it's a little bit difficult to access, but the cassette player and the mixer are kind of a pleasure to work on. They're, they're really quite beginner-friendly for a refurbishment project. So that's the 144 and the 244 comparison. Moving forward, I mean, the 246 has a much more elaborate mixer. I can talk about a bit more about that later on. But after the 244 and the 246, they did away with this two-band parametric EQ and you start to see the 424 range. The original 424 was high, low shelf, much like 414 after it, 144 before it. Um, but it's not really till you get to the 424 Mark II where I would say that you've got something that's broadly equivalent to this. But yeah, the later models, they brought in a three band EQ instead, expanded the memory features for the tape control. They brought in a second mono 
effects end which was dual purpose as a tape queue they didn't have the tape queue separately so there uh, with later models there isn't really a, a one for one equivalent with this within the Tascam range it's like this is the next and in my opinion better iteration after 144 and then they started to design their units kind of differently Force Tex 260 I think was pretty much a direct response to this unit in much the same way that the Fostex 160 was a direct response to the TIAC 144. I don't really know of anyone else who was in the market around that time, the early 80s. I don't think Yamaha had brought stuff out yet, Ari and so on, I'm not sure. Anyway, let's talk about what this actually does. So the cassette player, um, it's a three motor system, meaning that the raising and lowering of the heads, the uh, turning of the take up and supply reel, and the turning of the capstan, each have their own separate motor running those. The tape speed is three and three quarter inches per second. That's double the speed of commercial tape. Uh, so if you were to play back a commercial tape that you'd bought from a high street retailer that sold cassettes and you know you got your Duran Duran tape or your Metallica tape, whatever, you put that in here and it's going to sound like the chipmunks, it's going to play back at double speed more or less. Um, you've got a pitch control here that's plus or minus 15%, but even at its lowest it's going to sound far too fast. Um, so this isn't a unit that will play back low speed tapes. It is capable of recording all four of the tracks at once and you do that by putting it into this four channel mode. This middle position on the switch means that none of the tracks are going to record. You can see that record light went off. It's on. It's off. Uh, if I put it in sync mode, you can record it two at a time. So you can record it one or three and two or four. So I could record one and two together three and two together, one and four together, three and four together. But I can't record three tracks at the same time, if that makes sense. And as with all of these, we've got two heads, uh, an erase head and the dual function record and playback head. Whether the record playback head is recording or playing back depends on how you've got these other controls set up. And as we were saying earlier, it's got DBX noise reduction system and that is turned on permanently. Now there is a hack you can do uh, where you use, you know, for instance, breadboarding wires, DuPont wires, and you kind of do a little loop the loop uh, thing out of a couple of the sockets in the DBX board. And you can bypass the DBX in that way, but it's not a unit where there's a conveniently placed switch where you can just turn DBX on and off. Uh, nor is it a unit where you can use synchronization with MIDI or SMPTE or whatever very easily. In some of these units, there's a switch so you can turn off the DBX and track four so that you can send that synchronization information to the you know, MIDI converter box or whatever you have. Um, because generally speaking, those systems don't like the noise reduction, what it does to the square wave or whatever kind of wave it is that's being sent to the sequencer. So we've got these contact switches to control the transport. And if I turn on zero return, what that means is when it hits zero on this counter, it will stop. But if I fast forward towards zero, it won't stop. Um, so that differs slightly from the RTZ standing for return to zero button that was featured in later models like, you know, 44 mark 2 and 3 464 maybe you can hear there is a little bit of noise from the capstan motor kicks off when this switch in the top right corner is depressed to detect the cassette player there aren't any other memory features here other than the zero return and resetting the counter however there's a quarter inch jack you can put a, a foot switch in there. Tascam made their own, um, I gather from forums and so on, that um, one polarity or the other of a piano sustain pedal will work as well. But you can use that to punch in and out. You know, one click on the pedal is engage recording and one is cut recording out. So there is some punch in, punch out facility. Let's take a look at the rear panel here. So here you've got your mic line inputs. 
the design of the inputs here is such that you can input a very wide variety of sources. It will take um, microphone impedances from 50 ohms up to 10 kilo ohms. Uh, line level instruments are fine. Obviously it's going to change the amount of gain you put on the gain trim pots around here on the other side, but very versatile inputs, quarter inch jacks, they're unbalanced. And then over here, we have the tape out, uh, one from each track. They've come through uh, an off amp stage, but they haven't gone through the mixer in any way. So say you were going to digitize some recordings that were made on this, you're much better to record all four uh, simultaneously than record it in two passes out of the line out socket here. Uh, the reason being, if you do it in two passes out the line out socket, you know, recording uh, tracks one and two and hard left and right and then a second pass with tracks three and four also panned hard left and right. If you did that then you would find that the first and second pass the files were a slightly different length um, just due to inconsistencies in the motor speed. However if you use these four tape outs uh, then all four of your digital files will be exactly the same length. Now these access points We've got these RCA connectors again with a little U-shaped metal thing making sure that these are connected. When you remove that then that's a send receive for um, insert effect. So you could put a compressor, or a flanger, you know, some, some other kind of effect that you want to be printing to tape as opposed to running in parallel. You can run that effect through there. The other thing you can do with this is you can just take the output from an external preamp. So you've got one with an XLR input or better gain ratio, you just prefer the sound of it. Um, it's got phantom power, which of course this doesn't have. Um, you can take the output of that and put that in there and basically you're going to get the benefit of the mixer channel, you know, the EQ, effects, returns, all that kind of stuff. But you're going to bypass the gain stage, the trim pot. So that's very nice to have. Here we've got the tape cue, so that's a stereo signal that you derive using the lower part of these controls here for tape cue. Tape cue, you're setting up a separate mix for what the person recording is hearing in their headphones as opposed to um, what is coming through the mixer. It's just so that your listening volume doesn't affect the volume going to tape. Um, but when you're listening to these through headphones, then it is always monaural. However, you can create a stereo mix out of this pair of outputs here. The only way to listen to your tape cue in stereo would be to send that to a mixer that had its own headphone output and use that headphone output. I hope that makes sense. And then we've got the um, auxiliary receive. So really that's the, your effects return. The auxiliary send here is your effects send. These green capped uh, double, what's it? Double level pot. I think they're called concentric something or other is the proper name for them. But anyway, for these double pots, I'll go back over this again in a minute, but the center of those is setting the amount of signal that is being sent out to that output. And then this lower part is the pan. So it's possible to run these um, auxiliary sends through a stereo reverb and then back into the stereo input. And um, although all the channels on the cassette are going to be passing through the same reverb. You can kind of have where those reverberations are sitting. Um, you can control where they are in the stereo image. So like say you've got your guitar panned hard left, you can have the reverberation from the guitar go hard right. And you know, if your kick drum's in the center, you can have the reverberation for that appear in the hard right of the stereo image. So there's a bit of versatility there. I mean, it would be better if, as is the case on say the 246, um, we could take these and put them on their own channels and then we could EQ them separately. But uh, it's it's relatively versatile. That's the socket for the foot switch. Um, so you can punch in and out that I was talking about. And then we've got um, line out. That's your master bus output. And then the auxiliary out is just a duplication of the line out. So you can send that to speakers and to another recorder at the same time. Now let's talk about the mixer section and any other controls we haven't already discussed. So this input selector here, microphone line, means that the signal for this channel of the mixer is coming from the input socket at the back 
which we were looking at earlier. Uh, if we set it to tape, then the corresponding track from the cassette is passing through here and going to the left right bus, which we can listen to using the headphone socket. Headphone sockets, there's two of them. They've got an identical signal in them. They're in this bottom left corner where my thumb is moving. Or it's going to come out the uh, line out or the auxiliary out. And if it's off, then that channel of the mixer is dormant. The way the faders work in this grey day area, that's unity gain. You get a bit of boost if you put the fader up like that. And all the way down, obviously, you're going to cut it out. This two band EQ is in my mind, as well as I like having these big VU meters, and I'm just kind of fond of this unit because I've worked on it so much. This is the selling point. Uh, there is a kind of special mojo, some sort of special magic smoke or something in these uh, EQ controls. This one will go from 62 hertz. That's very low, you know, very close to the fundamental frequency on the low string of a bass guitar, all the way up to one and a half K, so right in the middle of the mid range. And this one goes from one K, so below the range that that will do. Um, all the way up to 8k. Sorry, I'm turning the top part, that's actually the gain, it's the lower part of these pots that um, controls the frequency. And uh, these just sound really great, I mean if you're only going to have two controls, although the high-low shells that you got in the 144, uh, 414, 44 Mark 1 are nice to have, I think these are more versatile. I mean, an absolutely ideal situation, and really only the Tascam 388 has that, so far as I know, would be to have two band parametric like this and the shelving EQs, but I digress. And then we've got this auxiliary control. Really, this is um, this is your effects end. Um, this switch turns it off altogether, or it means that it's post fader and EQ. So in this mode, your reverb unit, for instance, isn't going to receive any signal from channel one unless the fader is up. Whereas if I put it in pre mode, then even if that fader is down, this gain control is still going to send some of the input signal to your attached reverb unit or whatever is attached. Echo could be something else. As I said earlier, these controls here, the center controls the amount of signal being sent. And then this lower part controls where that monaural signal is going to be placed within the stereo field of the effect. Um, so you can set that opposite to how the pan controller is using it. So say this is a guitar, I want the dry signal to be on the left and the reverberation from the guitar to be on the right. Then I can do that. So I think we've covered everything with the exception of this monitor control. So monitor control is really changing what your headphone signal is. So in remix mode, this is also what you would use for bouncing, um, but it's for mix down as well. So the tracks from the tape are coming through here and you know, you're setting all your levels and creating a, a stereo image using these pan controls. In Q mode then what you're hearing out of the headphones is mono signal, sound that's on the cassette, the level of which is controlled per track, so track 1, track 2, track 3, track 4, by these pots here. No stereo information unless uh, you're listening to that through this Q output on the back that we talked about earlier. And then the auxiliary just allows you to hear only what's being sent via this system. Um, out the back and being received as a control level for how loud it is. So sometimes you'll find that like reverb or something's got some gain of its own and it's starting to feed back in the system so you can turn that down or it's a bit too quiet you turn it up. In terms of repairing the unit I would say that overall this is a good starting point for somebody who wants to get into repairing these. There are certain aspects of it that are somewhat difficult to repair like for instance I think I already said earlier in this video in here we've got a pair of boards that have the record playback amplifiers bias controls and some of the switching on them and it's pretty inaccessible it's, it is a headache to get out and put back in but the transport is really nice to get working it's like large it's quite you know it's like a land rover there's not all that many moving parts 
in some transports, like there's loads and loads of little springs and everything needs to be oiled and lubricated. Um, this one's nice and simple. Um, it's not as time consuming to get working as some others are. It's pretty easy to get the mixer channels out for cleaning. And I mean, another huge advantage of this model compared to some others is that I've got a lot of information about how to repair this. This YouTube channel is going to give you a lot more information about dealing with how this model is going to break down. Well, at least at the time I'm making this, I mean, I'm hoping to make this channel like, really comprehensive on how to tear down and fix all sorts of tape machines. But this is the unit that I was specialising in for a long time. I've got loads of spares. I've got a lot of experience with all the different things that can go wrong with it. And I've tried to put a lot of that up in video. So um, you've got that knowledge base to draw on that you might not have for some other multi trackers. It's not as feature rich as some of the units that came after it. Uh, the 246 has a bunch of advantages, like it's got an extra two meters so you can see the master output and the per track output at the same time, which is nice. The 246 is dual speed, you can turn the DBX off. It's got a separate sync out. Uh, the routing from the mixer to the cassette player is more versatile. Um, you can apply the same kind of EQ to your effects returns and uh, you've got two auxiliary sends so you've got the option of either treating that stereo return in the same way as the 244 or you can have two monaural sends so you could like you know send your dub track to a, a echo and a reverb whereas really you've got to choose one or the other on this 244 so that, I mean the 246 is a bit bigger bit heavier um, but it kind of has all the stuff that you might miss on this uh, later on the 464 and the 424 mark 3 I think those are kind of descendants of the 246 so I would be inclined to use one of those three units now rather than the 244 but um, I am very fond of it it does sound really good as long as you don't dislike that DBX sound I like it it ends up sounding kind of warm and you know, basically it's cutting out some high so it makes it sound like the lows the low mids the mids are a bit louder by comparison and I like that anyway I've kind of uh, lost the thread of what I'm saying here I hope I covered everything if there's an aspect of this that wasn't clear check the first comment I will be looking at the comments from this video and if there's any errata then my highlighted comment in the comment section will cover any of that check my channel for loads more content like this including 30 videos and how to fix this particular unit. Um, I've got a cover of John Carpenter's The Thing that I did on a 244. Probably be doing some recording with one of these again. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.